Welcome, everyone, to the L7C Podcast NBA Edition. Today, we are going to be talking about the National Basketball Association with our NBA basketball aficionado, Mr. Evan Debo. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great, Martin. There's a renaissance in Philadelphia at 1776 again. (laughs) James Harden. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I do want to say, even though it's been, uh, we're in the first month of 2022, second month, and I think this is your first podcast of the year. Is that right? It is. So I'm I'm excited to uh, to dive into 2022 with uh, all things basketball, and um, there's been a lot since we last last talked about Christmas Day and everything else. So um, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of surprises, continued surprises. And um, again, it's why we love the NBA. That's true. That's true. So what we got for you guys is we're just going to give you a a rundown of the conference standings right now going into All-Star break as of recording on Tuesday, February 15th. We're going to talk about the trade deadline that just happened this past Wednesday about the biggest moves. And we're going to talk about All-Star weekend because it is in our home state of uh, Ohio uh, and the biggest, and we're going to talk about our biggest surprises and disappointments of the year this far. And you know how we end every hoops podcast. We're going to be talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers to close the show. So Evan, let's first start off in our conference, the Eastern conference currently right now off NBA.com and ESPN. you got the Miami heat in first place with a 37 and 20 record. You got the Chicago Bulls in second with a 37-21 record. You got a team called the Cleveland Cavaliers with a 35-22 yeah. record, two games back of first. And then you got the Philadelphia 76ers, 34-22. Milwaukee, the defending champs, 35-23. And Boston, 33-25 at six. Then you get into that play-in game realm. You got Toronto, 31-25. A team a lot of people wouldn't expect down here. The Brooklyn Nets at 30 and 27. You got the Charlotte Hornets at 29 and 29. And then you got the Atlanta Hawks at 26 and 30. Evan, real quick before we go to the West, what are you thinking about the East right now? A lot of thoughts. Um, two and a half games separate first through fifth place. It's still so, so clustered. I mean, it's just been kind of a neck and neck race this entire time so far. You know, we'll touch base on the Cavs a little bit later. Um, again, just amazing how much they've they've been able to sustain, you know, a number of injuries. Garland's missed a whole bunch of games recently, and they still found ways to win with a, nursing a, a light back injury. I don't think it's anything to worry about. Lori Markkinen twisted up his foot. He's been out a while. I mean, the the heat, the resurgence of the heat after, you know, a down year post-bubble, you know, they wondered, we wondered if they were kind of one and done, and they've, they found a way to uh, to really push through. You know, I think um, teams like teams like Boston and Toronto, particularly that were were outside, were were kind of in that nine, ten, and um, and lower range, have really started to have a resurgence. I mean, we've it's been the same group all year: the Miami, Chicago, Cleveland, Philly. But uh, you know, there's been a lot of push. Um, you know, Philly, and you know, I think Joel Embiid, the, the MVP of the league this year. Agreed. Um, they Agreed. they handed it to the Cavs pretty well the other night, and he had a forty piece. Um, and then you add James Harden on there too. So they go from a negative of not having anything to with, with Ben Simmons never going to play another uh, minute of basketball for him. So now you have James Harden, right, wrong, and different, injured, what have you, um, that, you know, they're, they're now a, um, a really compelling team. And then, you know, don't count out the, the defending champs. I mean, I think if you ask me today who's coming out of the East, I'm still going to put down Mil- the Milwaukee Bucks in fifth place right now. So I think, mm-hmm. it's, again, there'll be a lot to be played out with in terms of um, – seeding and you know when we head into the final 20 some games here but um you know real quick what we didn't touch on is kind of our our poo-poo platter of the east um of sorts just surprising team so indiana had a fire sale um we'll touch base on some of those trades in a little bit detroit we expected to be down here orlando we expected to be down here um you know washington i thought you know they're only four games back of 500 but beal is now shut down for the season i thought we thought more of spencer dinwiddie who didn't even make it past the trade deadline and then, you know, the, the Knicks that were, we were so high on and thought were going to be a playoff team, I mean, they could still easily climb in. They're only two games back of Atlanta for the bubble or for the play-ins. 
you know, that's been surprising. Julius Randle's re- reportedly won out. They traded for Cam Reddish, um, who, you know, is struggling to even crack the rotation. There's rumors Thibodeau doesn't even like him. Uh, didn't want him um, kind of thing, too. But, I mean, a lot of a lot of cluster, a lot of compelling things. Kevin Durant's going to have a say about this before it's all said and done. But the East is very, very, very peculiar, um, particularly up towards the top right now. You know, it's kind of funny when I look at the top, around like one through five with Miami, Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. And to me, maybe this will show my age, but it kind of reminds me of the old 06 days with like the LeBron Cavs and like the Ben Gordon, Kirk Heinrich Bulls up top, D Wade's and Shaq's Heat and like AI and Andre Iguodala's 76ers when I look at those five teams. And then like Michael Red's like Milwaukee Bucks. I'm like, man, what year is this? 2006? Like the Bulls, the Cavs are at the top of the Eastern Conference right now. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, too, I mean, he, here's the, we talked about kind of the cluster of things. Again, it's just one thing that just kind of really popped out to me just looking at the math again on the game's back. We think about the coaching change that's happened in one particular city I'm about ready to name that, you know, the lack of depth, the lack of front court size and guard play and everything else. Um, they've got very high quality players, but if, let me just point this into perspective for you and just see if you get the same shock as I do. I mean, don't manufacture it, but I mean, to me, I'm shocked that the Boston Celtics are four and a half out of first. Uh, especially with the way they started the year. Yes. That's kind of, it's really shocking. Very really bad. Yeah. I mean, too, I mean, it really, that's just the eye opening me that they're that far away. I mean, and we, we've seen, you know, a couple, a couple of weeks go by and, you know, people move in the standings, players get hurt. Um, you know, we saw how many games in a row, 11, 12 games in a row that, you know, Brooklyn just fell, you know, and they're, they're still in eighth place and three games above 500, but that also shows how far ahead they were at the time. So, yeah, anything can happen. Boston's currently on an eight game winning streak right now. And like, obviously with Brooklyn, who was just on that double digit losing streak and just got a win, like yeah, we'll talk more about it with like our biggest surprises and disappointments. But you're right. The Eastern Conference, there's a lot to be played in this last stretch of the season after the All-Star break. You ready to head out, out west to the sunny side? Yeah, let's go out west. So w- number one seed we have or currently is, is things head into the All-Star uh, weekend here. Again, Phoenix has been leading the way. Phoenix and Golden State have been leading the way, respectively. One, two, Phoenix at 46 wins. The L7C Suns. The L7C Suns, followed by, you know, the Memphis Grizzlies, mm-hmm. 40 and 18. I mean, again, That's not to have 20 losses yet. It's just crazy. Followed by the Utah Jazz at four, five, five and six are Luka Magic in the Dallas Mavericks um, and the number six Denver Nuggets. And then your four playing teams of Minnesota at seven, Clippers at eight, Lakers at nine, and the fire sale blazers at 10. Um, and then if we go full poo poo platter on the West, let's just compare apples to apples. You've got the new Orleans Pelicans still trying to be relevant and make the play, uh, play in followed by the San Antonio Spurs, Sacramento Kings, Oklahoma city thunder, and the Houston Rockets. Martin thought. I think one of the craziest things with looking at it, which like you just said, man, Memphis doesn't even have 20 losses. Like they're 20 and nine in home, 20 and nine away. Like they, and I know we talked about Joe Embiid because I agree he should be the MVP, but John Morant has to be at least a top three finish. Has to be. I think so. And then obviously, too, with I always call them the L7C Suns because we were that year they went to the finals. We said they're going to make it at least to the Lesser Conference finals. They're just killing it, man. Like, I don't know if you've seen, like, Chris Paul recently and him and Devin Booker. Like, they are on a mission to get back to the finals. They are. They're first first in points scored in the league, second in field goal percentage. (laughs) Again, just killing teams with with a continued mid-range game. They're hitting their foul shots at near 80% of the team, eighth in the league. Um, Three-point-wise, they're sixth in the league. I mean, they are the run-and-gun L7C Suns. Assists, obviously, they're top five. Um, they do turn the ball over a lot. Um, they're they're sixth in turnovers. I, actually, I should say they're they're sixth in 
gaining turnovers. They are quite the opposite. So defensively, they're active in the passing lanes. Um, I mean, they're they've they've gotten Aiton back in in the last uh, last few weeks. I mean, and just picked up Torrey Craig again. So I mean, they've got they've got a number of things. Bismack Biombo for a long time resurgence. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's been it's been impressive to see things going out west. And then for Golden State, I mean, they're still in the hey, we're we're fine tuning underneath the hood right now with getting Clay Thompson back, but um, he had a, a really good 30-plus game the other night, um, averaging 17 in the 15 games he's had. Um, you know, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, still not where we normally accept Clay to be. But, you know, over the last few years, they've built a culture of, you know, again, plug and play with uh, with Otto Porter and Andrew Wiggins, all-star Andrew Wiggins. Thank, shout out K-pop. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Jordan Poole, too. That, you know, they've had they've, – they've continued some of these guys, Damian Lee – Jonathan Kaminga is coming and had some, you know, he's he could go for twenty any any given night. And and he, I've been really impressed with Kevon Looney defensively too. I mean, they just have a number of of active wings and everything too. That I mean, Golden State's going to be right back in this for me. Um, Martin, what else do you see as we go down the the uh, the standings here out west? Uh, one of the biggest things too that people need to pay attention going into the second half of the season is the Denver Nuggets. Obviously, we said where they are currently sixth right now. Yeah, they're yeah. currently yeah six, six in the West right now. And then if you look at their roster, and obviously the current MVP, the Joker, who obviously should get some consideration for that. He's leading his team in every statistical category: points, little twenty five point eight, thirteen point seven rebounds, seven point nine assists, one point one, one point four steals, and zero point seven blocks. And I would say everyone needs to watch out for them because they're still slated to get Jamal Murray back by the end of the season going into the playoff run. We'll see how effective he is. And maybe they get Michael Porter. Maybe they get Michael Porter back too at the end of the season. Right now it's saying that he's slated to come back potentially right at the end of the season. So if you get those two guys in, depending on hoop rust and all of that, that could be a very dangerous team going into the West playoffs. And if you're a betting person to put a little cash on right now and to, if um, all their players come back healthy. Yeah, they haven't ruled out Michael Porter um, just yet. I mean, obviously the nerve pain and you know the back stuff has been, it, it's what we knew why he was drafted 14th when he came out mm-hmm. was, you know, it's a uh, um, high, high risk, high reward. Um, he's had two of, I think three, three and a half seasons now, severely affected by the back, the surgery, and now the pain, the the pain that comes along with the nerve issues, nerve damage and stuff. But I mean, you get those players back in addition to the number of folks they have around them, Aaron Gordon again, and you know, other folks too. I mean, it's it's been a, kind of a culture developed where, hey, you plug these guys back in, and I think they can cause some serious damage out there. You know, Bones Bones Highland's been a really good draft pick off the bench too. Um, Jermichael Michael Green, or, um, not Jermichael Michael Green, sorry, Jeff Green, mm-hmm. uh, continues to to re uh, reinvent himself, and you know they can do some small ball stuff with him. Um, really impressed. Going down the list too. I mean, I I've been really impressed with what I've seen out of Dallas, you know, as well. Um, just sitting a, ahead of them, obviously it's it's heavy Luca, but I mean Jalen Brunson continues to emerge himself as a, a really good fifty percent shooting from the floor, sixteen points a game. Uh, five assists, three boards. I mean, not the biggest guy on the court. Again, very, very productive. As we go down the list, too, I mean, some surprises here. I mean, it, we finally have a somewhat good Minnesota season, 30 and 27. Obviously, Anthony, Anthony Edwards, Edwards and Cat and, 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 and D'Lo are, are, you know, being productive 16 and 10 in the last, or 16 and 10 at home, 6 and 4 in the last 10. You know, I, I'm really, we got to talk about the, the, the two LA teams, Martin. You know, for the the Lakers, for obvious reasons, you know they've they thought that you know, hey, we can we can sell high on Taylor Horton Tucker, and you know, their Russell Westbrook is owed forty six million dollars next season. Um, I don't think I don't think their problems are three thousand percent Westbrook, but I mean, again, this is this is what comes with LeBron. You cash cash in all your chips at the casino. They got the chip out of it. They don't have a draft pick again till. 2023, a first round pick until 2023. Stephen A is already, I saw a clip today saying, I mean, he just, Palinka needs to shop AD and see what they can get out of him. I mean, 
look at all the injuries and stuff too. I mean, it's been outside of the bubble thing, which, you know, history might not be kind to saying that's a fluke or whatever that, you know, they've really struggled. I mean, that's a team also that sat fat and didn't do anything at the deadline will be a, a buyout candidate team. You know, they might really benefit from, again, as we've said, I'll plant the seed again. You've got a timestamp for me of, uh, Gordon, um, Goran Gordon Dragic potentially yep. going to the Lakers. And then we saw a report that, you know, he'd entertained today, officially finalized uh, things to go there. I'm really impressed with, really impressed with the Clippers. Yes. Um, you know, just no Paul George, no Kawhi Leonard. Um, you know, jury's still out on if those folks will come back. I mean, they absolutely robbed, um, robbed the convenience store getting in on the the fire sale in Portland and getting Norman Powell for nothing who, um, you know, I think was sent out or they, I think Port, the Portland, Portland might've sent out a first, I think last year, Toronto um, to get him too. Um, and then, you know, the, there was times where they were trying to shop Luke Kennard. They were able to retain him. Terrence Mann continues to be reliable to get Covington, you know, is another kind of wing defender in there. I don't expect a lot out of him. Amir Coffey at times has been super productive too. I mean, they've got a number of folks who are just out there scrapping. You know, Reggie Jackson continues to, to, to do really well. That I mean, this could be, to me, this is my, I think this is my sleeper team. If you get some folks back, and namely your favorite guy, playoff Paul, <laughs> and I mean, who knows on Kawhi? We never know on Kawhi. But I mean, if you magically had both of those guys by round three, if they were to survive to it, I think this could be a hey, they just take it all kind of year. I mean, they they got enough talent between the two to do that. Obviously, chemistry matters. Being able to stay on the court matters, and we never know with Kawhi. It's almost Kyrie Irving esque in terms of you just don't know. But I mean, this is a team that could be really tough against it. I mean, I would want to play him if you got both guys back and I'm Phoenix, the one seed, and they're the eight seed. Yeah, I wouldn't want to play him either. But since it is because it's the top six teams that automatically, so they would have to win a playing game though to potentially yeah. play Phoenix. So which right now, currently, you got Minnesota, you got the Lakers and the Blazers. So it's like, if they do win that playoff game, play in game, then true, I would not want to have to play as much as I have talked about him on this pod in our short existence, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard as an HC. That's something you really try to avoid until the second round or conference finals. So a first round against those guys, if they come back, would be very problematic in Phoenix's chances to repeat as Western Conference champions and go back to the NBA finals. But the Lakers, obviously, they're, they're the biggest story in the NBA past couple of weeks because of number 23 being on that team. And I've, I've watched a couple games, and now we're getting to the point now where Westbrook, who was just an MVP not that long ago, has to sit in the fourth quarter because Frank Vogel doesn't trust him in the fourth quarter. I like you've already said it, man. Like we've we dealt with it in Cleveland. Miami's dealt with it. It's just what comes with LeBron. You you go all in, and then your team doesn't have like a future or whatnot, and you're hand tied for the next couple of years. I mean, hell, we still I, I'll never forget the eighty eight whatever million we paid Tristan Thompson. So that has me real worried for Colin Sexton, who just switched to Clutch and Rich Paul in the last week and a half. Yeah, for that same reason. That's a whole other thing. Anytime someone's underneath them, it's just like, yeah, they get a little bit more money than they're needing, and then they hamstrings the team, and and then they're screwed. But I just think, man, with the Lakers, it's crazy because it's just like they don't play defense at all. Like, their defense is terrible. No. It's, it's really bad. Obviously, at the beginning of the year, LeBron had that tweet saying, keep doubting my team, keep making jokes about us being old or whatnot. But the thing is, they are old. Like, they are an older team. And they're not going to be able to play these 82 games full defense. And then you got to play in game if they make the play in game, which they should. But if AD gets injured again or something happens to LeBron, they won't make the play in round. But it's just, man, their defense is terrible. There's no real. Trevor Reza wasn't good three years ago, let alone now. Yeah. There's no shooting on this team. Uh, Russ, I just never, again, I've said it. I remember saying, I just never liked the Russ and LeBron pairing. Like, I just feel like Russ isn't the type of player who could play off of LeBron James. 
He's not a shooter like Miller or Ray Allen or anything like that. But he, the way he plays, like he does his, he dribbles up the court, does a little hesitation, shoot a mid range. If it goes in, goes in. If it doesn't, then you're in for a long night if Westbrook's not making that. And he's turning the ball over a lot. It's just, they're not, I just didn't never like to, they should have took Buddy Heel. That's just what I'm saying from a chemistry standpoint. They absolutely should have. That's a good transition point to talk about where Buddy Heel did end up going. Martin, let's get into a little bit of winners, losers of trade deadline. I mean, there's a lot of ground to cover, but I'm going to start off with the loser. The Sacramento Kings. Yes. Fan, let me specify. Sacramento Kings fans, you had this promising, promising guard that when you didn't have De'Aaron Fox on the floor um, to kind of stop the ball a little bit, in Tyrese Maxey, who's produced so, so much, studded kid out of Iowa State, and you trade him and Buddy Heald, who I think, I could be wrong stats-wise, I'm just I'm not even going to spot check myself. Um, pretty sure nobody's hit more threes this year other than Steph Curry. Um, he Maybe he's dipped and he's number three in the league on three point, per, per, uh, three point, uh, mate, or three point shots made. But you ship both of them to Indiana for DeMontis Sabonis, who they were trying to move anyway. I feel so bad for Sacramento. This is the same team that passed on Luka. It's the same team that continuously makes bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Like, it's just, they're just, they're the top of my loser list, Martin. Martin, who do you have as a, who do you have as a, as a winner next? So that's my, that's my big loser. Who's, let's just go back and forth between winners and losers. That's a who, hard. Who do you have? Let's go positive. Who do you have for a winner? Oh my gosh. That is a very hard, that is so hard to follow up because, Honestly, I, I, I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna go homegrown. I'm gonna say the Cavaliers. Winner. I, I, yeah, I think the Cavaliers are a winner. I've always, I mean, personally, me, I've always liked Levert, and I think adding him to obviously Columbus's people, own, Columbus's own, and also people forget, like you brought his name up, and we'll talk about that Rich Paul stuff later. But people forget we lost Colin Sexton at the beginning, basically at the beginning of the year, but like ages ago. And now we got Levert. And I really feel like that's going to be a key piece to, I'll say it now, get to the second round of the playoffs at least. So I think with that move alone, the Cavaliers, that was the first real move. I was just like, oh, we got Levert. This is okay. I think the Cavs are a winner in that regard. I think I think it will be. I mean, adjusted expectations. I mean, I, I think people would have been ecstatic if the Cavs made said it to make the play-in games this year. I think it, it, they'd be ecstatic if they move to if they move to uh, take on the uh, um, the first round after play-ins. And then, I mean, I think that's new. Now the expectation, you're exactly right. That I think it's it's second round. I mean, I absolutely think they're a winner too. I mean, Kobe Altman deserves all the credit. Um, I hope he's a strong consideration for executive of the year. I mean, you you look at what they've had to overcome. Um, their leading score from last year, uh, mm-hmm. Colin Sexton played 11 games and then ACL gone. And then mm-hmm. they had that great West Coast swing and they started to get rolling on rolling in terms of schedule. They knocked out all those games early. They survived it. We're starting to uh, really, really compete with Ricky Rubio. Then Rubio goes down. So it's been kind of a clunky. They, they immediately went out and got Rajon Rondo to keep the ball moving and, um, you know, run some pick and rolls because, I mean, the beauty of having three seven-footers is defensively you've got three seven-footers. The bad part about having three seven-footers offensively is they can't run pick and rolls and they can't set themselves up on offense. Uh, Lori Markinen, spot-up shooter, uh, basically. Mobley and uh, Jared Allen are your role guys. You bring in somebody like Karis LeVert, and I hated that it was at the expense of Ricky Rubio. Yes. I'm really hopeful we can – now, how it, how it works out with Bird Rice and everything else is that he will be an unrestricted free agent. I've seen at least one report that I'm going to look way too much into that, that I've probably is not even legit, that there might be mutual interest between Rubio and the Cavs on returning next year. Absolutely would love to have the man back. Just great for the locker room, did so many great things for us. Um, the Cavs uh, brought on Jose Calderon as a 
a basketball op executive assistant. I'm not quite sure what the title is, but they're fairly good friends from what I've heard from international play and everything else that I'm hopeful that's the case, but back to Levert. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're the Cavs, you expend your first round pick this year. And I mean, would you rather have an unproven rookie in eight months that, you know, again, outside of the lottery because you've done so well, or would you rather have Karius Levert now? Um, now they did give up the Houston uh, 33 that would have been uh, technically or 30, 32 pick, 33 pick would have been top of the second round quasi look at as a first round pick, but I'd rather have Karis Levert now. So you bring in a guy who has played with Jared Allen multiple years, can run, pick and roll, can just go get ISO buckets, which his team needs. I mean, I'm still hopeful that I've liked what I've seen so far that he has been really forcing the action a lot. Um, it's been able to help us spell Garland for a couple other games, but you got a guy who can pick the roll, pick and roll, who can move off ball, um, who can work a couple different actions when Garland's got the ball to get open. Um, it can just go out there and score when, and when this team has struggled at times, it's because the, the offense becomes stagnant. They don't have enough ball handlers. People aren't moving off ball. And I mean, again, just shout out to the Cavs and, um, and Kobe Altman for going out, reinventing themselves yet again, finding a patch in Brandon Goodwin's been phenomenal. It came at the expense of Taco Fall, um, for a two way contract. He's come in, helped a little bit at the point. You know, again, in a guard play, again, Rajon Rondo's helped for a spell. But now you've got Karis LeVert. You're primed to make a, a run. I mean, and uh, I'm excited. I, I also think winner. Well, that means you get the loser. You get another loser. I have to get another loser? Oh, no, man. you can well, do a winner. I know who I'm going to say is a loser, but it's my first. I know who opinion. I'm going to say. Well, let me – maybe we'll overlap here a little bit. Winner, I'm going to say – is Daryl Morey. And obviously you could go two different, two different ways here, right? You could also on the quasi and say loser from about to say you're Daryl Morey. You have got a situation where um, Ben Simmons is never going to play basketball for you again. I, I don't know. His came in, tried to come to a couple of practices. So he didn't get fined. Started chucking the ball at people. Wasn't participating in drills, like um, checked himself out said for mental health, but then wouldn't comply with mental health doctors, which is awful in the age of mental health that, you know, that we're even questioning if, if what he's talking about is legit in terms of his pursuits on, you know, finding a balance uh, in life and stuff. But you go from that and you're held hostage and everybody knows like you've got a used car on the park on the parking lot that uh, you can't move. It's the end of the, it's the end of the year. You can't sell it whatsoever. And lo and behold, the Brooklyn Nets do it again. They, they give you James Harden. James Harden forces his way out of another superstar situation. And you bring him in with Joel Embiid. And you go from having nothing whatsoever to now you add, again, right, wrong, and different. Harden's been injured. People questioned, you know, was he mailing it in, what have you. The Harden era comes to the end with Durant and Irving only playing 16 games. Um, Daryl Morey's a winner. You give up Seth Curry, you give up, you cobble together some contracts and Andre Drummond to make the money work. Um, Daryl Moore is my next winner. I mean, just uh, amazed that he held out, shows it's better, best to wait it's, at times. And Ben Simmons is on to Brooklyn in that deal. And uh, James Harden is in Philadelphia. And I think they're going to make some solid moves in the East. So my loser that I'm going to say next, since you went a... GM person. I'm going to go player. I'm going to go Christoph Porzingis. Because if you would have told me about, man, four or five years ago that the unicorn from New York was already going to be on his third team, just getting shipped from the Wizards. I mean, shipped Here to the front. Yeah. Unicorn crypto is tanking real bad right now. Yeah, that, that statement is dead. He's no longer the unicorn that we saw in New York. Obviously, he was hurt a lot throughout his uh, career. But the biggest thing, too, is like when he was on Dallas, he was supposed to be the second, the Robin to Luca. And then you saw the reports that he didn't want to be a second fiddle to Luca. It just wasn't working. So then he gets shipped to the Wizards, where obviously with no Bradley Beal right now, they're in no man's land. So I, I do feel like his luster is gone. I don't know if we'll ever get it back. Martin, they had to attach a 22nd, a 2022. Pick top 45 protected to him yeah to get to him, him on he's apt that's that's bad to get spencer dinwiddie and davis Birdman. 
So, yeah, so Kristoff is a, a loser for me in the trade deadline. I think loser for me next. This is tough. There's a lot of options here. I think loser for me next is going to be the Portland Trailblazers. So, I mean, I and I say that with an asterisk because they've kind of cleared the deck for trying to entice a free agent or – you know, whatever. Lillard's out for the year. You punt on the column. And, I mean, part of me as a Cavs fan could have been like, man, I'd almost rather have CJ as opposed to Levert. Um, Although CJ's a little bit older age-wise, Cleveland kid. I think he's, I think CJ's better offensively than Levert is. But that's not to take away from Levert. I mean, again, Levert's still a young kid, yada, yada, yada. But you punt on him, you give all those dudes the Clippers for nothing. Um, you essentially put, took two first round picks, sent them to Houston for Robert Covington, and then dumped Robert Covington along with Norman Powell, who you also shelled out considerable assets for to the Clippers for essentially a cap dump. Um, Portland Trailblazers are my next losers. I have no idea what's going on out there. Well, just to go off that, I mean, if they're losers, the Pelicans got to be winners. I mean, I think they do got to be winners. Like what they were able to add, they got CJ, Larry Nance Jr., Tony Snell, and obviously they're still in play-in bubble potential. And you got Brandon Ingram, who's really good. I don't know. Someone asked me this, and I still don't know what's going on. I think it was my father. Like, what is going on with Zion? Like, if he's even going to play this year at all, I'm like, man, I don't know. I was never. Let me just say, I mean, I don't. I hope the best. I hope that young man has a long career. But, I mean, coming out of Duke, I was incredibly fearful of this. Like, I I feel like I've been pretty consistent on – I just don't see – you know, when you have to – when you're having conversations year one about, we got to retrain this man how to walk, that just doesn't add add up to a a long career for your viable – and contribute and everything else. I mean, it's the luster of the idea of Zion so far in his time in the league far out exceeds what he's actually done or been around for. Again, I hope, I hope the man, you know, has, you know, again, I I'll use the Cavs references, Junior Sogaskis, whose feet were made of, now granted Zion right now is better than Junior Sogaskis was, who ended up being an all-star, but at least once, but I mean, the big Z had like, paper bones in his feet and plantar fasciitis and glass tendons. And he wanted to have a really, really long um, career in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope for the best for Zion, he becomes everything that we, we hope he's going to be. But right now he just, you know, he just kind of looks like a long, and I'm more fearful of this. We went through the same thing with Embiid. Let me find a better comparison, right? Where, you know, we knew what Embiid could be. Um, he couldn't hold up. He struggled with making the jump to the league and, you know, had, had tons of lower body issues, fatigue issues. I mean, he was in and out for four or five years and now he's the MVP of the league. Like I hope we're at that spot with Zion, but I'm, I'm really, really fearful that we're not going to get there, Martin. You know, the only thing with that is only time's going to tell, but it's just, we're going to this. He's probably not going to play this whole year. Then we'll see what happens. Next, next year. You got any more winners and losers? Or I know you you hinted, you gave your thoughts on getting James Harden for the Sixers and Daryl Morey, and obviously that was the biggest blockbuster star driven trade of that day. But what do you think from the Nets side? Yeah, I mean, I think for I think for Brooklyn, I do think they're they're losers in this to an extent. You know, they gave up. I mean, look how many picks they shelled out. I mean, this is really you know, the Boston trade take two. I mean, you gave up all these assets for James Harden knowing, you know, again, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, but you thought, you know, reuniting him with KD was going to be the piece and everything else. I mean, again, they were, they were seconds away from, you know, if Durant's foot wasn't on the line moving on last year, and this could be a really different story, but you know, fate had a different, different take that day in that game seven against the Bucks, but um you know they've they've gave so many picks to to Houston 
they gave up Jared Allen and Karis LeVert and to different places. And, and I'm tickled pink. They're both on the Cavs now. Um, but you gave up all that in addition to get Ben Simmons. Like part of me is like, why couldn't you have structured a three team, you know, something. Cause I mean, th- we had these conversations, I think last year, same kind of concept too of, Hey, could this be a three team trade? And like I listened to some folks today talk about it could be some kind of conspiracy of did James force his way somewhere temporarily where he had no say and in Houston would not send him to Philadelphia because of the relationship with Daryl Morey that Houston just didn't want to even deal with Morey. Um, did he force his way there temporarily just to again force the issue with Brooklyn and go over there? I mean, part of me says good on Brooklyn for realizing, hey, you're you know, you, you've been dating this chick for a little while now and, and the, the writing's on the wall, get it. You see all the red flags, like, let's just, let's just cut her losses here. I mean, cause they had to, because James could have walked, James could walk at the end of the year. So you get Ben Simmons out of it, but it's, it's more of, it's more of still what they, what they gave up. I mean, they could have, I don't know, they could have potentially found something else or whatever. Um, by this point, because I think it, if they did had to do it all again a year ago or a year, yeah, a year previously, I don't think they they have traded for James Harden again, knowing what they know now. Hindsight's twenty twenty, but I mean they've got to be losers in what they've given up. I think. Yeah, because I mean with Brooklyn, which everyone has said, like people have said, they won the trade. They got Ben Simmons, a elite defender, which is true, an elite passer, playmaker. They got Seth Curry, who's a good shooter. They got Andre Drummond, a big body. They got Patty picks. Mills. Patty Mills. Like, I, I think my biggest thing that hangs me up with the Nets is like, yeah, you have all these pieces now, but KD should be back after the All Star break, and your second best player still can't play home games. Like, I, and they have a lot of they have a lot of games on the road left. Yes, and games, or sorry, no, 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 they have a lot of home games left. Yes. The inverse. And they end of the away games. They're playing in Toronto where Kyrie can't play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they've got it. It's tough. I heard, I saw one story. I don't remember if I even shared it with you or not. Maybe I did. But I mean, I think for part of it for James is he's looking at, I think Kyrie's still doing Kyrie stuff behind the scenes. I saw a Cavs beat reporter tweet out about a, a, a right, wrong, and different. If this is conjecture or not, that when the kick, Brooklyn Nets came to Cleveland, you know, Kyrie still afraid to confront his own demons that he created is literally in the locker room, like Sage again, trying to get off the, the, the spiritual um, bad juju and everything else for the game. And James is just staring there, like eyes as big as quarters, deer in the headlight, like, Oh my God, I got to get out of here. Um, was was kind of the tenor of the the article that I saw, but I mean that's that's it with Kyrie. You know, Kevin's still a bad dude whenever he comes back, kind of thing. But I mean, again, the other part that people aren't talking about, Martin, is Kyrie Irving is a player option after the season. Yes, I think Kyrie. I think I think the one predictable with Kyrie Irving is expect the unpredictable. Mm-hmm. I'll leave it at that. You know, I think it would be kind of crazy, too, if he does leave, which I'm I'm with you. It, it, I could flip a coin if, if he'd leave or not. But the fact that, like, Kevin Durant went to Brooklyn, like, for Kyrie, like, teaming up, yada, yada, and then, the, and then if Kyrie just bounces, because, again, we're hoping the world gets better, but we don't know where the world's going to be at. Um, next NBA season starting, if we're still doing the COVID, like, if he still can't play home games because he's unvaccinated. Like, I don't know if you, someone would want to deal with that for another. I don't know if he'd want to deal with that for another 82 games and he can go somewhere where he can play whenever he wants. So that's a very good thing that you brought up there. But I mean, the Kyrie stuff, obviously we, we saw Boston implode with him, the Cavs and now the Nets. It's just what he does, man. It is what he does. Yeah, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, the Nets, they have work to do. It's not like they're the top seed 
in the East right now. Currently, they're at eighth and 30 and 27. Obviously, when Kevin gets back, things are going to change, but we still don't have a timetable on him. So, uh, and Kyrie, like you said, man, most of their games are at home, which are basically that's a detriment to them because he can't play. He's just, a, I mean, an absolute walking enigma. He really is. And I mean, there's there's a lot to be said. I think they definitely have more firepower around them this year for what it's worth than compared to last year with with Patty Mills, with Seth Curry, um, all those folks. So the one last trade I want to comment real quick on briefly is I'm glad the Milwaukee Bucks flies up and said, hey, our rivals across the division, the uh, the central leading Cleveland Cavaliers right now, they got a lot of size. We're going to have to go out and get somebody. So they they brought in Serge Ibaka from the Clippers to help with their Evan Mobley and Jared Allen problems. So good on them for recognizing that, hey, we're going to need some more size here. Brooke Lopez has missed considerable time that we we need we need something to to help combat the Cavs. So speaking of the Cavs in Cleveland, we got an All Star game coming up, Martin. Yes, we do. Uh, through February starts February eighteenth and will be held to the twentieth in Cleveland, Ohio. The eighteenth is the All Star Celebrity Game and the Rising Stars Game. The nineteenth is the Skills Challenge. You know the Taco Bell Skill Challenge, the three point shootout, the dunk contest. The NBA and HBCU Classic presented by AT&T, Morgan State versus Howard University is going to be at 2. And then All-Star Practice will be at 11 on that Saturday. That will be presented by AT&T on NBA TV. Then Sunday, you got the G League next gem game on NBA TV. And then you got the 71st NBA All-Star game at TNT and TBS at 8 p.m. Do wish I had... The finances, because I would have loved to go to an all-star game in my home state, but it just oh, did not work way. out. It just did not work out this year. Was not I was not properly planned for being here. So, but man, Evan, are you going to be watching All-Star Weekend? I know when it comes to the game, the game could be a glorified exhibition game until the fourth quarter, where they can get a little bit more serious when the game is close. Dunk contest. Everyone says it hasn't been what it has used to be. But there have been some glimmers. The thing I always get more excited about is the three-point contest, especially when, when people like Steph Curry and all of them are in there. But Curry is not in this one. So are you excited about this weekend at all? I definitely am more more than years past, for sure. So, I mean, I, I, I had stake in the game when, you know, when – LeBron and and Kevin and Kyrie were in the All Star games for mm-hmm. years past, and dating back to that, LeBron, and then you know there were a couple of All Star appearances we got out of Mo Williams, Big Z, um, you know those kinds of things that you know hey we've got Darius Garland, and now because of James Harden too, we you know the the world's the world's corrected itself, and we've got Jared Allen, we've got two very deserving All Stars in the game, like so that just through the game itself, it's glorified exhibition. That's what I'm going to be looking for. And then, you know, I love the – I always feel like this is where you hear, like, all the stories, like, that we don't even know yet three years down the road where it'll be like, oh, it was in this game where, you know, X, X player talked to Y player and they started talking about teaming up or whatever. Like, you know, I'm not – I love where the Cavs are at right now. I'm not a, oh, my God, I need you to come back and save us, LeBron. I was just but, about like, to bring I, that up. I love – I love that Darius Garland was his first pick off off the bench of the of the reserve options. That I mean, he, he called he knows the moniker. He calls him DG the PG. Like he knows all the things about. Like I'm excited. I, like I apologize, podcast listeners. My uh, <laughs> Apple Watch is also very excited uh, that LeBron picked him off the bat. So um, wanted to call LeBron to thank him itself. My Apple Watch. But anyway, so I'm. That's what I'm excited about is. Once you start getting those matchups, I'm excited to see, you know, uh, the first, you know, lob if it's just DG to um, Jared Allen off the of pick and roll, and uh, or you know, DG to LeBron or LeBron kicking out to DG for a deep three, like all those things and the side stories and the game within the game. I'm super excited about more than ever with the game before. But traditionally, it's the Rising Stars game for me, just based on where you know my team, the Caps, have been where, you know, you normally have young players and, and rookies and sophomores that you want to see, you know, make a name for themselves on a big TV. And a lot for these young, struggling, they're struggling teams, 
you know, you have is you get, you know, not a lot of national TV time, even for the Cavs. I mean, I think this would be helpful for them from, you know, branding standpoint too, is, you know, Martin, they're third in the East right now. You know, a couple of days ago before the Sixers lost, they were number two in the East. You know how many games in the last, let's, let me put this in perspective, how many games in the last three years that have been national televised games featuring the Cavs? So talking NBA TV, ESPN, and TNT, ABC. Has three years? Yes. One. Nail on the head. You got it, buddy. It was an NBA TV game, I think, three weeks ago on a Friday against the Charlotte Hornets. That's it. Yeah. So there's a good opportunity here for, you know, in the uh, skills challenge, um, which there's going to be a three team of, of Mowgli, Allen, and uh, Garland participating in it to the semifinal, the four teams drafted for the uh, Rising Stars game. And um, Isaac Okoro will be playing in that as well, um, along with, Evan Mobley so I'm excited for those two but it's the game within the game I I'm going to go on record now and say that you know there's few times where you notice where there's a carrot dangled where certain players step up for things that they really want when circumstances change do you take a look at that that new Kobe Bryant NBA all-star MVP trophy yes I did it's got the King of Akron written all over it, Martin. I expect <laughs> him to come out and go hard after it. Harder than he should be going for a, for a guy that's got a lot to prove for the Lakers for the rest of the year and carrying a, a big load that he doesn't need to be weighing a lot of minutes in it. And, and I see him going after that, that trophy. He ain't about to let John ja Morant get it. He ain't a, about to get somebody who didn't have a connection to Kobe Bryant like he did as a, as a competitor and friend and everything else. So that's, that's what I'm also excited to see. How about you? So I've, you already brought it up to how it's just funny how LeBron has the two Cavs players on his team. And obviously the things like, well, is LeBron, you know, testing him out before when he leaves L.A. to try and come back to Cleveland to finish out his career type thing. But I just also think with the people getting the recognition they deserve, like, I mean, I'll already say one of my surprises besides the Cavs is the Bulls and DeMar DeRozan is absolutely just going off, especially the past six games and then seeing him as an all-star starter. But my favorite times are usually like Saturday night. I do like watching the three-point shootout. I do like watching the skills competition. I do like watching the dunk contest. Obviously, it hasn't been all that super spectacular, but I like seeing those events because I just remember the old – old ways in the early 2000s, a la that just had his anniversary of Vince Carter's dunk contest. And those were the premier events of the All-Star weekend. And also just on the Cavs thing, which that's one thing the NFL does better than the NBA. If they have a team that's unexpectedly good, they can flex games out of their national schedule. And the NBA does yeah. not do that at all. They do not. It's it's a disappointment, uh, but again, it just shows hey the opportunity the Cavs have ahead of them this weekend. And also, one of the favorite things, even before the game, is also when LeBron and uh, Durant were picking the teams, and Durant had the last pick, sweetheart, and Gobert. That was entertainment. Oh man! <laughs> and I love that the NBA. I love that the NBA TV guys were all about riding it and being sarcastic and LeBron holding up the clipboard trying to hide from it too like it that I mean that was just I mean bravo absolutely bravo I think that's worth important too so I mean we haven't really talked about uh, just real quick because um, we're getting close on the hour for for yes. rosters so team Durant consists of you know Kevin's not playing Joel Embiid, John Morant, Jason Tatum, Andrew Wiggins, Trey Young, LaMelo Ball, Devin Booker, Rudy Gobert, Zach Levine, Chris Middleton, DeJounte Murray, Carl Anthony Towns, and Draymond Green, who I believe is not playing either. So, And then for Team LeBron, uh, obviously LeBron, Giannis, Steph Curry, DeMar, Jokic, Jared Allen now is their replacement um, for James Harden, Jimmy Buckets. Luca, Darius Garland, uh, James Harden, who's not playing, Donovan Mitchell, Chris Paul, and for the first time, 
in his career, the undrafted mm-hmm. Freddie Van Vliet. Mm-hmm. Martin, I think LeBron's team is boding well to uh, take this on again. I see a lot of talent over there. Um, I'm excited for, for Darius to be a part of that environment with Chris Paul and LeBron and Luca from a playmaking standpoint and everything else. I think there's going to be a lot of lobs. Um, LeBron's, LeBron's teams have fared pretty well in this draft selection um, mode, and uh, I think he and Curry are undefeated when they've been on the same team. I like them. Yeah, I don't think it's – especially since, like, Durant's not playing, I don't think – Team Durant has a chance. I don't even know. I don't think they'd have a chance. This was a serious game. But I would say watch out for, we talked about the Kobe Bryant MVP. Watch out for Devin Booker trying to get that. Hmm, good point. I could see that. So those would just be someone else I would watch. But, yep, All-Star Weekend is February 18th through the 20th. Uh, this weekend in Cleveland, Ohio. It's going to be a great site. It's going to be great for the city of Cleveland. Uh, can't, I'll be interested to see how they um, – I'm pretty sure he'll get a whole bunch of cheers. When LeBron gets called, you know, kid from Akron, Ohio, he used to play for the Cavs and helped him get a ring. So that would be – I think I think you will. If you if this were five years ago and he's still a member of the Heat, absolutely not. But he will get a good, good, yeah. good cheer here. So as we are approaching that hour mark, Evan, I do want to talk about just real quick uh, some of your – disappointments and successes of the teams of who you think at the halfway point, obviously talk about the Cavs before we close out. So what a couple teams are disappointing to you going into the halfway point of the season? What teams are super like, man, they're doing really good. And then we'll go Cavs. Yeah. I mean, obviously the, the Cavs are the Cavs and bulls are, are towards the top of the list in terms of surprises. I think Memphis Grizzly is, is the Memphis Grizzlies are up there as well. Um, Dallas will kind of put in that, that spot. And again, the Clippers, we touched base on a little bit, just with how much they've lost and how much, um, you know, they're, they're still relevant. They're the eighth seed in the West from a disappointment standpoint. I mean, if this were three weeks ago, I'd absolutely say the Boston Celtics, but they're four and a half games back of first now. I mean, they've been on a reel lately. You know, I, I think from a disappointment Side, if I'm looking east, um, I, you got to talk about the New York Knicks. You got to talk about the Atlanta Hawks. That we have not really hit on the Atlanta Hawks this year. Again, this is a team that you know made it to made it to the second round last year and was poised to. I mean, they're four games back of of 500. They're still in that discussion, but you know, I think we were definitely thinking Atlanta's more of a four or five than the 10th seed uh, as of tonight. You know, so I in them coupled with. You know, where the Knicks are at, too, uh, down there at 25 and 33. I think those are my disappointments out west. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't really see outside of, you know, again, just how the injury thing unfolds and stuff with, with Portland and the Lakers. I mean, those are kind of my teams. I think I saw, you know, I think we all knew East Oklahoma City, Sacramento, and San Antonio were going to inherently struggle. So, I mean, it's, those are, those are my, my teams, I think. How about you? So for the positives, uh, Chicago Bulls, I mean, I'm really loving how DeMar DeRozan and them are playing. Obviously, the Cavaliers as well. And I was the same with you a couple of weeks ago. I would have said Boston effing terrible, and they need to blow that up. And Jalen Brown, like Tatum, both and one of them are both got to go and just tear from the ground up. But obviously, they are the sixth seed, so they have improved. So I just want to keep doing positives before I do negatives. Uh, the Memphis Grizzlies. I, I just can't harp on it enough. 40 and 18. No one thought Memphis would be where they're at right now. And John Morant should be a top three MVP finalist. Uh, disappointing. I mean, I, I got to go with the biggest news story. The Lakers. It's just the fact that you have. Cause Russell and Anthony Davis. So three top 75 greatest players of all time on the same team and they can't even be over 500 right now they're five games back below 500 and just watching them they've just been terrible another disappointing team for me you already brought up the knicks because i was really high on them last year especially when they made the playoffs because it's good for basketball when the knicks are good so them just being a one-hit wonder has been very disappointing uh for me and then i don't 
I was going to say Brooklyn, but they just had a whole bunch of issues with Kyrie and Harden and Durant being hurt. So I won't say them. But then I guess another disappointing team. I really, yeah. No, it's just really those. Yeah, New York and the Lakers for me. But let's get to the most important thing. Evan, take it away with the Cavs. So speaking of Cavs, yeah, we're gonna make this short because they're uh, they're playing right now. Yes, they are. The they're Hawks. playing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we're about a quarter quarter way into that game, but um, you know, for the Cavs, the rest of the way again, I'm just I'm just so grateful. I mean, this is a team that all the big everybody said was only going to win 28 games, and here we are coming to the All Star break, and they have 35 wins. I mean, they're they're on pace to. I mean, unless something crazy happens, I mean, they're on pace to hit. Um, you know, 50 wins. So, I mean, you're, you're talking, I think, so they played what 57 games now. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you add, so they're out of the 25 games left, they'd have to go 15 and 15 and 10 the rest of the way. And I think that's very doable for this team, you know, again, with minus injury, but you know, again, I'm, I'm just, they've done it on the defensive end. This team just got so much grit to them. JB deserves, <clears throat> excuse me. JB deserves to be uh, coach of the year. You know, they just, uh, Evan, Evan Mobley, you know, we got to find time. I think it, it, and this is coming at a good time for us to get him some rest. He's starting to get into that rookie wall a little bit where, you know, he's never played this many games in his life before that kind of thing um, where it's a big growth and, you know, all your joints are starting to get sore and everything else. DG, the PG, I mean, averaging 20 points, eight assists and three boards and a steal a game. Um, just phenomenal. I love watching this young man play basketball and just how shifty he is. I don't know. It's been, I don't, I mean, you, you can talk about point guards being crafty with their intellect and, you know, knowing how to, to hunt mismatches and, and run pick and rolls and everything else. But I mean, he gets you going one way and you go another. I mean, it's got a little Kyrie to him, but he's jerky with it versus Kyrie is very fluid. There'll never be another Kyrie with just out there spinning a yo-yo, but, you know, with Darius, I love watching the man play play basketball with his court vision and everything else. Um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about um, Kevin Love, who's mm-hmm. sacrificed a lot, was chucking basketballs at people last year. He's happy. I mean, we're winning games. He's had a number of double doubles. He's averaging fourteen and seven off the bench, two assists. I mean, he's he's out there chucking from three. I mean, but he's he's close to forty percent. I mean. We need that kind of shooting because we don't have it in a whole lot of other spots right now. But, um, you know, the rest of the way, I'm just excited to see where they go. I mean, I think I'm not, I'm not naive and, you know, like a diehard, like 12-year-old Cavs fan who's like, you know, oh, my gosh, I have some things bounce their way. They could be in the finals. They're not getting there, but I'm enjoying the ride. I think all of Cleveland, the state of Ohio, is enjoying the ride, and we're excited to prop up our, our young kids. Um, just a well-deserved season on the all-star all-star festivities this weekend. Yeah. I have nothing more to add on that. Perfect ending on the 35 and 22 Cleveland Cavaliers who are playing right now. And after we are done recording, we'll both be watching them, but uh, thank you, Evan, for always being our basketball expert on the L7C podcast. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you everyone for listening to the L7C podcast. Again, All-Star Weekend is February 18th through the 20th here in Cleveland, Ohio. Make sure you check out those festivities. And if you're in the area of Cleveland, Ohio, if you have a ticket or can afford a ticket, you definitely should go check it out. Seeing the best basketball players in the world gather and put on a show. Uh, With that being said, thank you everyone for listening to the L7C podcast. Signing out. Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C Podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.